Hello there. Um, this is uh, Beck Lambert, Lady Liminal. Um, um, and um, I'm just taking a look at the questions that you've sent me. Um, I think it's easier for me to respond to them via a recorded message rather than uh, typing them um, because I can speak more freely this way. Um, so um, hopefully my answers will make some sense to you. Um, I'd like to say thank you uh, for inviting me um, to uh, take part in this for Dark World. It's very kind of you. Um, so without much further ado, because it is <clears throat> a bit late <clears throat> here in the UK, and I've got a stack of work staring at me, I will crack on. So I, I'll read each question out so you know which one I'm responding to. So, right, first question. Your site, Liminal Worlds, suggests that the world we live in contains areas where a different, more expansive reality is readily reachable by human beings. Is this a fair description of liminality? Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty fair description. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure you're already uh, more than aware of this, but um, liminality comes from, it's derived from the Latin word limen, uh, which translates as threshold. And uh, for me, that is the crux of liminality, thresholds. Um, now, I know that there are lots of people who, um, they kind of approach liminality from a purely physical perspective. And I know there's lots and lots of people out there in social media land and beyond who are kind of obsessed that the only things that are liminal are um, hotel lobbies, corridors, hotel bedrooms, etc. Um, but the truth is, liminality permeates everywhere. It's and it's it's um, it's reachable um, by anyone. Um, I think that there are spaces within the world that um, are perhaps more deeply liminal than others. But I think for me, the reason why liminality surrounds us and, you know, is attainable by everyone is, um, is because I... I don't just approach liminality from a physical perspective. Um, I also approach it from an abstract perspective. And I feel that when you put these two elements together and, and look at the world within these contexts of the physical and the abstract, that's when the magic really begins to... Um, happen uh for example um with uh on de underpasses as liminal places now for many people they find underpasses really scary places places they don't want to uh meander in um and you know that's true i think everyone approaches underpasses with a sense of trepidation whether consciously or unconsciously but the fact is from the moment you enter into the underpass you have crossed the threshold you are stepping away so to speak from the land of the living the land of light you're going into this almost semi or fully subterranean um, landscape um, you have to move through it. You have to push on through to reach the other side. Um, and you go through various spheres as you walk through these spaces. You aren't the person 
upon upon exiting, you're not the same person as you were upon entering. Because you've pushed on through, you've you, you know, if your fear is is blatant, you've you've managed to contain it in order to move through. Um, if perhaps it's more unconscious, there's still something in your gut saying to you, perhaps there's something perhaps unsavory lurking in the shadows, in the tenebrosity. But I think they're not just, I I don't think we can, we can look at underpasses in purely negative contexts. They, you know, they, they are sites, they are places of ritual activity, mass ritual activity. You know, for most people, most younglings' um, first forays into um, drinking, perhaps drug taking, take place in underpasses. For many people, their their first sort of faltering steps into uh, physical romance, erotic fumblings, you know, however you want to refer to it, <laughs> um, take place within an underpass. Some people drink within them because some people run to underpasses because they want to escape. Like me, when I was a child, I wanted to escape the bullies, both at home and at school, on my estate where I grew up. I felt safe there because nobody else wanted to lurk within it. They were scared and I wasn't. So in a way that kind of gave me a, a sense of power in a way. I still can't describe it to this day. Um, but yes, we these things that may seem everyday, mundane, maybe even deviant to others are ritualistic acts and they they help us to transcend in a way transcend away from the everyday life if you're down there with your friends you're listening to music you've got repetitive beats you might be drinking some beers or you might be smoking some gear or something or if you're there with the object of your affections and maybe you know you're getting to know each other a wee bit better shall we say um you are caught up within acts that are enabling transcendence whether that's transcendence from childhood to early adulthood, uh, transcendence from being sober to maybe being um, a bit drunk or under the influence. If you're listening to repetitive beats within a contained space like an underpass, um, you know, you get caught up within that. It's almost shamanic. And these elements, whether they're undertaken separately or or all together in a way, these induce euphoria. And it's when we start, you know, edging into euphoria that we are removed, not necessarily physically, but metaphysically. And for me, that's where the liminal comes in. When I walk into an underpass, or I I go to an edgeland. I don't. Do I physically think that I'm? Do I think that I'm going to be physically removed from that space? No. But metaphysically, yes. Every, you know, there is every chance. If I can concentrate, if I can lose myself, I will find find my way. And so for me, um, I, when you say, when, 
referring back to your question, are there areas where uh, these more expansive realities are readily reachable by human beings? Yeah, as I said earlier, certain areas are stronger than others. But for myself, I think we're surrounded by liminality. A doorway in your in your house, in your home, is a threshold. Um, every time we step out of our front door, we're crossing a threshold into something completely different. So I think it's not just certain areas. I think it's all around us. So I hope that's... Uh, <laughs> managed to answer that question. Okay, so second question. What convinced me that the physical world is permeable? Well, that's quite that's quite a broad question. Um, I think I think it first started in childhood. The the flyover, the underpass that I mentioned in in your first question. When I went in there, when I would go there to hide. I felt I knew that other people were scared of that area and whenever I stepped into it as I said in the previous question um, I felt special almost felt brave and it always felt that just stepping into that space I had stepped into somewhere different not just physically different in the sense it was dark and it was dank and but metaphysically it was different obviously I didn't know what metaphysical meant as a child but I knew it was different the sounds the the reverberations the echoes it just it all played on a young girl's imagination and um yeah, it. I knew that by sitting in this space, placing my hand upon the concrete struts, I was connecting with something. I didn't quite know what it was, but I did know. And then as I got older and um, I was able to explore further into the world, um, I developed a real passion uh, for caves and the first cave I went into um, which well actually no I'll go back slightly I was still a child and uh, my father was Welsh and uh, I'd gone home to Wales um, to see some family I wasn't very old maybe 12 13 and um, there's a there's a really amazing waterfall in the Brecon Beacons, which is uh, um, a mountainous region in southern Wales. And the um, the waterfall is called Istrathelta. I can I can send you the word in for that the, the spelling. And Istrathelta is amazing because it's in the bottom of a valley. So even just approaching it, you're sort of coming out of your time, so to speak, going down. But the really amazing thing of Istrafelta is that you can literally walk behind the waterfall where the water over millennia has um, eroded the, uh, the rock. You can step behind so your back is against the rock and the water is falling in front of you and I remember I was stood there with a couple of family members and that was a profound experience the roar of the rushing water feeling the rock against my back 
seeing the way that the sunlight as it was refracting against the water it was the mind started playing well not tricks it started opening up huge possibilities to me and it was almost through gazing through the water it was almost and you looked through that what was beyond wasn't the world that I inhabited on an everyday basis it was something different it was almost as if the land of the fae was beyond that and if and that if if I could just reach my hand out and put it through the water that was tumbling down I could be transported there I mean obviously there was no way I could do that my my elders wouldn't allow me I would have been taken away with the water but that had a really profound effect on me and it stayed with me all these years a a long long time and then I went into my first cave-in system um yeah actually again that was in Wales and it was down the mines I had elder relatives who had been coal miners and one of the mines had been opened up to the public and I went down. I'd never been, apart from the underground system in London, which is very different to a, a coal mine, I'd never been this kind of underground. And I remember as we went down and down and down and it got warmer and warmer as we're going deeper into the earth. And I just started thinking, I could hear these noises, could feel these vibrations. And it was like a pulse. And I thought, I'm crossing over into something very different here. And when we stepped out, and the heat caught me, and the darkness, we had like headlamps on. But our guide said, switch your lamps off. We're going to switch them off for 30 seconds. And I'd never experienced darkness like it. It was tenebrous, inky, thick. It was almost like I could feel it. It felt velvet, so dense. You couldn't see anything, for, even with your hand right in front of you, you could see nothing. And I could just feel this pulse from below my feet. And to this day, I still don't know what caused that. I would say it was the hum. I, um, I since have been told that I'm very sensitive to the hum. And I think that's what I felt. And I knew then that I had come into, some people may call it a non-place, an interzone, but I knew that I had crossed into a completely different realm. And not just the fact that I was I was uh, subsurface, it was more than that. I was in a place where I wasn't, I was allowed to be by the, by those who decree, but I wasn't meant to be there. I could stay for a wee bit, but there was no way that I was going to be allowed to tarry. And that's when I knew, I thought, yeah. So I did, I I entered this permeable place via a lift. How can I find the other permeable places? And that's when I started searching. I got into caves in a big way. And being an archaeologist was a really great way to explore caves. Um, I'm a prehistorian by training and um, 
going into the cave systems of southwest and France where our prehistoric forebears sort of between 15 and 40,000 years ago and beyond painted, put their imaginations, their imaginings onto the walls for us still to see today. They knew. And uh, whenever I walk into a cave, the deeper in you go and the colder it gets, and 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 the smaller the tunnelways become you know that you are moving beyond not just away from the world of light but you're moving deeper into something again that you may be permitted to tarry in for a wee while but you're not meant to stay there And there's this whole concept of the narrowest path is the holiest. And yeah, it's, uh, it's almost, um, addictive. So I, 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 so I, I've done the subterranean and I still go with that, but permeability can be found in everyday spaces, really. Forests. The moment you cross from, as you approach into a forest, now most people can drive to forests and there's car parks and kiosks and stuff. But the moment that you leave all that behind and you take your first step over the threshold, into the peripheries of the deep forest, you know the light changes. The sun dapples in certain sections, but in others it's almost pitch black. The bird song changes the deeper you get in. The arboreal beats get stronger. You can feel the energy emanating from the flora as the hours pass and you you start hearing the sounds of different animals those of the diurnal begin to fade away to be replaced by those of the nocturnal you feel the air get heavier that there's a presence there, a presence that you can't necessarily put your your finger on. You can't you can't ascertain it exactly. And sometimes it can change. You one moment it can seem very benevolent, the next malevolent malevolent, you don't know and yeah. So we have that element, the, the, the forest, but also within urban contexts. Um, we can walk through spaces, whether it's housing estates, whether it's shopping centres, uh, skate parks. Think, I think it's... Um, it's a question of perception. Many people, they don't pick up on these, I suppose, vibes, for want of a better term. But if you concentrate hard enough, and you don't need any training in this, you know, but if you concentrate, if you tune in, then, um, yes, it's amazing what can manifest before your eyes. And all that perhaps beforehand you saw as every day, perhaps boring, mundane, suddenly begins to appear before you in very different guises. 
So yes, I suppose a combination of waterfalls, <laughs> coal mines, caves, forests, and just about everything convinced me that yeah, there are uh, that the world is permeable, um, and that's without even uh, going up into the sky. Um, I'm frightened of flying, so I don't do that so often. But getting an aeroplane, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> Right, so the third question, does being an archaeologist boost or hinder your own liminal research? Well, um, for myself, um, it boosts it. Um, all the... Um, all of my research, so... Um, if 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 you're not aware, so the liminal world says there's four key um, projects um, which come together to form the liminal worlds. Underpasses, the liminal places, future ghosts. We are all ghosts in the Maychem. Paranoid architecture, Balladian concepts within Neolithic contexts, and dialects of the hum and although these all these four projects may seem really disparate at first uh, and rather strange um, they all um, they all intertwine um, quite beautifully if I may say so myself but all four of them uh, have their foundations within archaeological research. So for me, um, archaeology has opened up lots of, of avenues of, of research li within uh, the liminal for myself. And referring back to your previous question about when did you, when we, when were you convinced that the physical world is permeable? Um, I mean, through my studies as, a, as both an undergrad and a postgrad, um, especially within prehistoric contexts, um, we the evidence that has been gathered, not just in the UK but around the world, shows that our forebears from at least twenty thousand years ago. Um, saw the world um, in different perspectives and, and and considered that there were places that were permeable, places that if they if they ventured into them would enable them to head into different realms, one of a better term, and caves again. We know that these these particular spaces were considered very special um, from certainly the Upper Paleolithic, so from 25, 30,000 years ago through to the Mesolithic. We found burials within caves, um, artwork, um, as I mentioned earlier, um also material culture that leads us to believe that rituals were taking place in there whether shamanic were what we people weren't living in caves but they were using them so did they venture into these caves did they perform ritual activities create artworks in there because they they believe these spaces to be thresholds into other worlds, whether that's worlds which were inhabited by their gods or their ancestors, their forebears, or by something different completely. Um, did 
the stepping into these spaces heighten tensions, heighten um, magical properties. Um, was the fact that these cave systems went deep into the earth. I, I'm sure that that's one of the reasons, like for myself, that we have this concept of permeability. But also then, again, as with liminality, we can't just think about it within physical. We have to think, we have to think about it in the abstract. So, um, and one of those abstracts is not just art, visual art that people can gaze upon and lose themselves in um, almost uh, especially if natural narcotics were involved driving them into a sense of hallucination but also sonics so and this is something that I do in the underpasses as well, underpasses research. You've got repetitive beats in an enclosed um, location and they vibrate, they resonate and they can heighten senses, you know, and, and induce euphoria, which in turn can lead to transcendence. And this is something I would never have thought about unless I'd had my archaeological training. Um, when we look at the hum, uh, my hum research has very deep roots within animism. Again, I learned about animism through my archaeological studies. So... Um, and in case you're not aware what animism is, animism is something that is still practiced around the world today, where um, it is believed that energies pulsate through natural materials, natural elements, be it wood, water, soil, stone, um, and beyond. Um, now, those energies... Uh, for many, um, it's believed that those en energies are perhaps of forebears, loved ones who have passed over, um, gods, spirits. Um, for others, it's believed that it's some form of almost electrical energy that is coming from deep within the core of the planet. Um, now, my research takes all that on board and takes it further. But I wouldn't have had... I, the, 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 the dialects of the hum research would not be how it is today without that archaeological knowledge that that research that basis um and again with paranoid architecture that is um although that's myself approaching the neolithic through a kind of uh context of the author jg ballard um that project again would never have come into being if i hadn't studied um neolithic architecture um which is was pretty much my primary research uh certainly as a as a postgrad uh and in the uk the um the neolithic uh span from uh began roughly six thousand six and a half thousand years ago uh and sort of then transferred into the bronze age around four thousand years ago so, so yeah, um, a rather long-winded answer, but yeah, I believe that my my being an archaeologist uh, definitely boosts my liminal research. It 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 certainly isn't a hindrance. Um, I'd be lost without it. I love being an archaeologist. So anyway, yeah. So 
Next question, penultimate question. Okay. I recently interviewed a techno DJ who believes that the hum is present in all music. What's your take on his theory? Well, A, I love techno. I really love drum and bass and jungle. Uh, and B, I completely agree uh, um, with, uh, with this chap. I completely agree with him. The hum is present in all music. As, I, as I've mentioned in, in previous questions, the pulsations, the beats, um, you know, you, if, you, if you concentrate hard enough, you tune in on that. Um, and it, it begins to eat into you. It resonates within you. And from that, the resonance then leads you. It, it, it begins to remove you from where you are. And again, you don't have to be some sentient to appreciate this. Be in any nightclub um, or a gig or um, quite even at home, banging your tunes out loud, whether alone or with your pals. And you feel it and it's in you. And, it, and you just feel it begin to bounce around your brain and your bones and starts, I guess, from uh, a rather everyday perspective, you could say, yeah, it removes you from where you are in a sense. If you're having a bad day, you put some tunes on, it takes you out. But I think it's something deeper. It's like you're the hum this this universal beat that manifests in the natural the electric and the cosmic lays and music is a really great um conduit for that and techno in particular i mean i've i've been at some um illegal warehouse gigs back in the 90s uh with um techno and drum and bass DJs and yeah you are removed you are totally taken away and that was not under the influence of narcotics I do hasten to add <laughs> Just, but yeah I so I do totally agree with that and um I am doing some work at the moment um there's a really great uh drum and bass track from the late 80s called uh Valley of the Shadows um and it's let me just get the title for you it's it's an absolute banger and that is um i'm doing research on that at the moment the beat of that of that particular track in relation to um where it's played if you play it in an enclosed space especially a um an underpass it really starts to um play tricks on your mind yeah it's called valley of the shadows by origin unknown absolutely banging track and it does and it starts to play tricks on your mind um and uh you you're not sure if you're seeing things or not, or if you are really going through a transcendental experience. And that tune in particular, I'm doing some work on that in relation to, I watched In the Heights the other day. My sister loves musicals. I don't know if you've seen it, because even in the liminal worlds, we uh, we do like to venture out into the... <laughs> and uh, go and hang out with regular people and watch TV. And uh, the, the the series in that movie where the woman is in the underpass and has to decide whether she's going to pass over to be with her, her long-lost mother or to stay with the living. And it just got me thinking about this song that I just mentioned and the beats from that song. And driving you onwards, driving you towards that light. And one of the track, one of the um, the lyrics from that song is, 
um, I was in a long dark tunnel and there was a bright light so intense. So yeah, um, I do agree with the DJ. The hum is present in all music. The hum, I would take it further, the hum is present in everything. Every single thing. It can't be removed. So yeah. And now we're on to the final question. Okay, where are we? So is it possible for anyone to exist in a state of perpetual liminality? Wouldn't this be like living in a doorway, a kind of eternal stasis? Well, um, <laughs> now there are some people I know who would say that I live in a perpetual state of liminality. Um, I don't quite agree with that. Um, although I think the question would be, is it possible for him to exist in a deep state of perpetual liminality? I don't think it's possible to be in a deep state because... Unfortunately, we have to engage with regular life, whether we want to or not. But um, I do think it's possible to um, pass the days within a perpetual liminal state. Because whether we're conscious of it or not, we are constantly crossing thresholds throughout the day from the moment we wake up in the morning until the minute we pass out at night and even when we're asleep we go through thresholds again there's that's um you know that's this bringing together of the the physical and an abs and the abstract within liminal context and I don't think it would be, I, 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 I don't think it is like living in a doorway because you have to, to enter the limit. The liminal is about the threshold and about crossing the threshold. It's not about standing on the threshold. So you wouldn't be, if you're within the liminal, you wouldn't be living in a doorway, so to speak. You would be crossing over multiple doorways. So in a way, there is no stasis. Um, and, and, and something that I've written about, there is no stasis within the hum. There's no, you know, we are constantly changing. The person who I am now, I won't be in five minutes. I'm not the person who I was five minutes ago. I mean, yes, to look at me physically, I am. Uh, to hear me speak, I am. But things have happened, even me just sitting here in my living room. I'm sitting still, but I'm traveling. My mind is traveling. In this conversation, these past 43 minutes, I've been talking to you. I've traveled. I've traveled backwards in time. I've traveled forwards in time. I've traveled to Wales when I was a child to, to, to the waterfalls and stuff. I've, I've, I've traveled to southwestern France. I've been here. I've been there. These are thresholds. Again, abstract thinking. You know, they're thresholds. Um, and I think, and for me, this is how liminality presents. I think that too many people have, that their, their concepts of liminality are too limited. They're too settled. Um, they're too physical. You have to you have to embrace the abstract as well as the physical if you're looking to dive into the liminal worlds. 
you can't have one without the other. Um, it's just not obtainable. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, obviously this is just for myself. I can't speak for others and I wouldn't wish to, but, um, yeah, I guess, I, I guess, I guess I do exist in a, a fairly permanent state of perpetual liminality, not deep liminality. Unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, um. I'm fortunate to have lots of work on because of my research, but because I have lots of work, I, my opportunities to dive into deep liminality are, are lesser at present um, than I would like. Um, because obviously I, I have to, um, I, I have to uh, fulfill uh projects and things um, and uh, do interviews and, and so on uh, whereas um, on a day-to-day -day basis I um, I do wander within the liminal worlds constantly and I think that um, maybe, I don't know maybe that's why people are interested in my work because perhaps they realize that this isn't something that I, I can dip into and jump out of whenever I feel like it um, because that's not possible for me. It's part of my DNA. My flesh is completely enmeshed within the liminal and maybe that's why people... Um, for some reason, like looking at my images and like reading my words <laughs> and my crazy adventures. Um, it could be something completely different. I don't know. <laughs> but um, as long as people uh, enjoy uh, my output, then um, that's all good. But um, to be honest, I couldn't be any, I couldn't, I couldn't not be who I am I couldn't not do what I do and um if people didn't want to engage with my work any longer you know um that would be okay too because the liminal worlds are with me they've been with me all my life they will be with me for the rest of my life and if uh it ends up that I'm the only one wandering within them <laughs> <laughs> then so be it I'll, I'll still be happy so but anyway I hope I've answered your questions um in a in a way that uh, works for you uh if not uh <laughs> do please just drop me a line and I will attempt to answer them uh in a better manner for yourself um and uh thank you again for inviting me uh to uh be interviewed by you and um and good luck with uh with the project um and hopefully we'll get to speak again soon okay thank you bye bye